Today's program is a direct outgrowth of last year's program on the Salish Sea, where we learned, among other things, that who exactly has legal rights to the water in the Nooksack River is a subject of intense discussion, <coughs> potential dispute, and possible legal action. To shed light on this issue, we are delighted today to welcome to the City Club Tom McDonald, who joins us from Olympia, where he is currently one of the three members of the Washington State Pollution Control Hearings Board, which hears appeals from orders and decisions made by the Department of Ecology and other agencies as provided by law. The three members of the board are nominated by the governor, confirmed by the state senate. <clears throat> Tom has been a water lawyer for more than 25 years with experience as assistant attorney general for our state's ecology division with the Colorado Attorney General's office and most recently <clears throat> in private practice representing businesses, local governments, and conservation organizations. <clears throat> Many of us are vaguely aware of the undercurrents not only in our own community, but across the Western states, of the looming issues surrounding the one natural resource that is absolutely critical to life on Earth, water. We know that water is a limited natural resource that is decreasing in both quantity and quality, while the demand for water is increasing. Tom is here today to put these issues into legal perspective, to explain how the interested parties are attempting to deal with these issues to suggest possible solutions to the problem and to outline what may happen if the parties fail to come to agreement. As you can see from the flyer, and I know there's a lot of paper on the table today, but there's a flyer there, there's I think four copies, uh, uh, about a wonderful symposium next week on May 30th and 31st, sponsored by the Waira One Watershed Management Project, Whatcom Farm Friends, and Whatcom Watersheds Information Network, <clears throat> They're presenting a free two-day water supply symposium at Fox Hall here in Bellingham, which no doubt will be extraordinarily informative. <clears throat> feel, feel free to attend and participate. If you are interested, you should sign up <clears throat> soon as the available spaces are filling up quickly. At, at, on the table at the, end, at the back, here's the program itself. We didn't have copies uh, until, well, we don't have copies, but you have one. If you have an interested, grab one on the way out. It'll outline exactly what you can expect. So uh, our format today is a presentation by Tom, followed by questions from our badge-wearing members. So now, finally, please join me in welcoming to the Bellingham City Club, Tom McDonald. Thank you very much, Chuck. Um, it's quite an honor to be here, and if you don't mind, I'm pretty warm, so I'm going to take my coat off. Um, feels better, um, and if that's okay. I, uh, uh, very nice introduction by Chuck, and in fact, his summary of some of the issues up here is, uh, um, is very accurate, and uh, I want to go into it in a little more depth. Um, there are outlines on the table that I put together of just some basic uh, considerations in water law. I will uh, try to go through most of those. 30 minutes is nearly not long enough to go through even one of these in depth, and I don't really want to do that anyway. Um, I want to give you more of a general background and talk to you um, about some of the issues, and as Chuck said, uh, kind of how I see as uh, the state and the federal government and um, are dealing with the, uh, the issues that we have coming forth in the water. Uh, coming up here today, again, uh, you have to wonder why we have such a problem with water as I was in many rainstorms coming from Olympia, at least through Tacoma. Um, but we do have water issues, and uh, we, um, what it comes down to is the, it's an issue of scarcity. Um, we just don't have enough water for the demand that's out there. Um, the outline itself, um, well, let me, let me back up a little bit and tell you where, who I am um, and kind of how I decided what to speak about today in terms of how the, the specific issues. I, uh, um, I'm from Colorado. I went to Colorado State University and studied agricultural economics. Um, studying agriculture in Colorado immediately um, became um, uh, very familiar with water. 
and uh, um, that's where I became very interested in water law. Uh, in Colorado, the, uh, they actually have a water bar, and they're called the Water Buffaloes, and uh, they, um, it's a very elite group of attorneys, and you have to be at least 60 years old, I think, to break into it, but uh, um, they do, uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's quite amazing, um, the work that's done in, in water law there. I, uh, um, I worked for the, uh, I, I actually worked in Colorado after graduating from law school here at Seattle University and uh, um, in private practice and then came back here and worked for the state senate in the agriculture committee and um, staff there, a joint select committee on water resource policy, which is one of the, f it appeared to be one of the first times in several decades that the legislature was taking very seriously the problem with uh, conflict with water and growth management and environmental um, issues. Uh, and uh, s I worked with that for a few years and then went back to Colorado through Arizona, um, worked a little bit in Arizona, went back to Colorado and worked for the Attorney General's office there. I was in a group of attorneys where we, uh, um, we were in the interstate and federal dispute section of the Attorney General's office, which uh, I don't, think, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here when I say Colorado um, f does not like any other state taking its water. Colorado <laughs> does not like the federal government telling what, to, what it's supposed to do with its water. And being in this small group of attorneys, we pretty much had an open budget to do whatever we wanted to do in order to fight other states and the federal government. Uh, so it was quite revealing and we, and we actually had some interesting cases there um, on Federal Reserve water rights and which I'll touch upon here. But it, it just shows um, that the, the fights have been ongoing. Um, water is um, a source of life, obviously, and based upon the fact that it is scarce, it is a finite resource, it has become very much a source of power. Uh, and uh, if you go back to look at the history of the state engineers, especially from New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, Wyoming, you will find that it, it was as a powerful an issue as anything else in those states. Um, and there's been many books uh, written on that. Uh, and, uh, um, and so in Washington, it's a little different. And like I said, in, when I was in Colorado, um, before I came to Washington Attorney General's office, I, um, we had probably in my group, we had six attorneys. In uh, the general water law area, there must have been 30 attorney, assistant attorney generals. I came here to Washington to take over Charlie Rowe's position at the AG's office, and I was the only water attorney at the attorney general's office. So going from 30 to 40 attorneys doing water work for the state to one attorney just showed you how different it was here. Um, but it, we grew quickly. Um, I don't know if it was my fault or not, but we all of a sudden had at least eight to ten attorneys doing water work for the Attorney General's office. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I can go through the outline in, in detail, but I wanted, to, I wanted to just give you a little bit of history first. Um, and that's, what, that's, what I, that's one reason I like water law. It, it really is history. And, it, and it, like so many things, history repeats itself, unfortunately. People don't learn from it all. But, but it, is, it, is a great, um, it is a great historical lesson. And uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I find fascinating is, and in the, in the, in the um, outline you'll see it, riparian water rights, it's about halfway down the first page. We were a country that essentially took the common law from England. Um, everybody can argue where all our law came from, but especially when it comes to water, we believe that we had taken a law that was otherwise the king's law from England. And that was basically, when it comes to water law, is, is that the water is a public resource. It's to be shared by the public. It's to be essentially shared equally. Um, and the king kind of controls it, um, the throne. And really where you where you, the people that really have the right to use and enjoy the water are those people that are along the water. They're riparian to the water. They own land that are along the water. And uh, so that, that law came over and to, to the United States. And I'm being very general here, and, and, we can get very, and we can get into specifics later, but that law came over. And in eastern um, United States, that made sense because you really didn't need a lot of water often outside from the river. The municipalities, the cities grew up on the river. 
Um, the people that were along the river enjoyed it for <coughs> primarily your grist mills and your paper mills. They used the water and the force of the water, not necessarily a lot of water itself, but they used the, the stream flow. And it worked in, in the eastern United States, basically, um, in, uh, year, you know, 150, 200, 250 years ago. Well, when people started coming west, um, and you had the miners, and obviously the agriculture, uh, you didn't have, you, you needed water um, in order to do the mining that was being done away from the river. You needed to do, you needed water for the agriculture that was not next to the river. Where in eastern United States, you really didn't need to irrigate a lot, basically. And I don't mean to generalize there, but basically nothing like in, in the western United States. Well, when the, most of the land in the western United States was public land. Um, and people would just squat on it and start ir either irrigating, and not necessarily under the Homeland Act, they would just start using it. And miners were th the best at doing that. They came in and they started uh, mining, and they needed water. So they would go to a creek that would may have been two miles away, may have been even ten miles away, and start taking water out of that creek and take it all the way to their mine and start using it. Well, this was something totally different than what the riparian water right doctrine was, totally different than what was really happening in the eastern United States, and really nobody knew what to do with it. They were just doing it. Uh, and then the fight started to occur, because when the, uh, um, the people that came and started living on the river wanted the water and felt they, d they deserved it, because that's what was happening, um, it, uh, the rivers were starting to dry up because the miners and, some, and then the agricultural folks were starting to take the water and moving it away from the river. And these folks that were, all, were given the water, were, um, were starting to live along the river, were starting to find out they don't have the water they thought they should have. Well, this is how what we call the prior appropriation doctrine started. Um, people started getting in fights and it went to the courts. Um, the, the territorial legislatures really didn't know what to do with it. Uh, the federal government was hands off. They really didn't do anything with it for many, many years. And so it went to the courts. And, uh, and several of them went up to the U.S. Supreme Court um, on the fights of who gets this water. Well, one of the arguments was that when the federal government um, gave somebody a patent, uh, a patent for land, because um, they had you know, done what they had to do under the Homestead Act, um, they, the federal government had riparian water rights attached to that patent. So when you got that patent, you got riparian water rights. So these people started getting these patents along the river and got riparian water rights. Well, they come to find out somebody 20 years ago had taken all the water out of the creek to do their mine. And so the fight started to happen there. Um, wh who owns the water? Who has the right to take the water? And initially the people were saying you don't mine or have a right to take the water you had no right this is public land you took the water and you shouldn't have and now we have somebody that lives along that creek that has riparian water rights and they get to enjoy that water just just to see it they get to enjoy it it's it's with their patent so that's where we started really the conflict of the people that wanted to live along the river and have it but more than that, it's the how are we going to develop the West? And out of that came the prior appropriation doctrine, which is a totally different doctrine than the riparian water rights doctrine. And they started to, s and, they s and they, the court started to recognize the people that got to that water first and started beneficially using it was good for th the nation. It's what we wanted. It's why we asked people to go West. So we're going to protect those. And the courts were doing it. The courts were f going in there and saying, this miner, even though it's against the riparian water rights doctrine and against what we always knew, this miner has the right to use that water, even though it's on public land, and even though they didn't, they didn't, uh, um, they didn't buy it, they didn't do anything. You know, they don't even own it. So they're using, you know, and they're using the resources from the ground for mining, and they're, and they're actually using the resources from the water. And those people were protected. And so wh what I said was that the courts were protecting the people that got there first. And that's one of the basic attributes of the prior appropriation doctrine that we're under, that, we, that our state um, um, is, uh, that's our law for water, is, is that the first in time is the first in right. The first person to take that water 
has the right to use it to the exclusion of anybody else that comes later. Now, it's kind of inconsistent, you might say, with the idea that, wait a minute, this is public water. This is, this is everybody's water. We get to share it. Well, the prior appropriation doctrine kind of flies in the face of that because it's saying if you got there in 1880 or up in this county, I'm sure it's before that, um, if you, 1850, if you got there and started diverting that water, you're protected to have that water, to continue to use it to the exclusion of anybody else. Well, there had to start being per parameters put on that because nobody could just start using the water, stop using it, or use it inefficiently. So the prior appropriation doctrine is, like I said, which, which our state has adopted, basically, is, is that you can divert water, you can use it, it has to be used for beneficial purpose, which I, in the, in the outline I have on page two, a, a list of beneficial purposes. Um, it, and beneficial has two, two prongs to it. One of them is it has to be a beneficial purpose, which is the list. It also has to be used in a way that is not wasteful. Any water that you would take from the river and waste, which is a very subjective term, you don't have a right to. So you can't do that. You have to put it back in the river. Well, believe me, there's, there's, I'll go back to irrigation and even municipalities for that matter, took a lot of water out of the river um, and because they could and they essentially were able to like, let's say, take it through an irrigation ditch and the irrigation ditch leaked 90% of the water away. They only got 10% of what they took out of the river. Um, was that efficient or not? And uh, that's, sometimes you don't know. And, and one of the cases I took up to the state Supreme Court was, is that efficient when you have that much water going out of a canal? And basically it goes down, comes down to what's the custom? What's the custom in the area? If the custom is, is that that's what they do, then we're gonna go with that. Um, well, that started to change a little bit since that case. But the, uh, the idea was you have to use your water beneficially not only for the purpose, but efficiently in the sense of non-wasteful. The other thing is that you had to use it. You can't just stop using it and say, I have a right to use this water. It's my water. It has a priority of 1850, so it's to the exclusion of anybody past 1850, but I can sit on it. Well, the riparian water rights doctrine allowed you to do that. You didn't have to use the water to have the water right. Well, the prior appropriation doctrine changed that. They said, as long as we're letting you take water away from the water source, we want to make sure that you use it. And if you don't use it, it goes back into the river for the next person down line, okay? So that became the use it or lose it law, is you have to use it, and if you don't use it, we're gonna consider it abandoned under common law, and you no longer have that right. Now, who, who's gonna tell you whether it's been abandoned or not? It's usually, it was in the past, usually a junior appropriator, what we call them, somebody from 1900, let's say, going and saying, I get that water now because that person that has 1850 priority date stopped using the water and stopped using it for 10 years. So I'm gonna prove to you that they intended to not use the water and they didn't actually use the water. And so they would have the fight and many times the 1900 person would win. But the concept there was use it or lose it. Um, that was, um, so those basic ideas on priority date as to when you started using the water or intended to start use the water, the idea that you put it to beneficial use, and one thing I didn't touch on is you put a beneficial use in a diligent time period. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't waste your time putting it to use. I, if it's something that could have been done in a year, you should have done in a year. If it's something you could do in 10 years, you should have done it in 10 years. You should, you got to get the, your project put up to use, put to use. Um, they, um, uh, so that concept, that li what I call the due diligence, um, the concept of being efficient, the concept of, of uh, um, uh, uh, continuing to use it or you lose it, those all got codified then in what we call the Comprehensive um, Water Act of 1917. And so that's in the code under Chapter 9003 RCW, but it codifies all that common law. And one of the things to think about as we, th as we look at the law, and the reason I'm telling you this history is, is that those terms are terms of art that are in that law. 
They're defined by the common law. They are defined by the history I just talked about. And so when you look at the word beneficial use and you look at the word um, efficiency, and you, you have to think about where those came from why and, and what the, uh, um, how, how, how do you really want to define those is going to be based upon how they were developed in the common law, as we call it. And that's where the, so some of the cases that I worked on is, uh, the arguments were there. I, didn't, I cited cases from 1890, 1900 to tell the court, this is what this statute means. I go back 100 years to tell you what that statute means because that's, that's the history of it. Um, so that is a, a, that's kind of just a real basic background on how we got to the point where we are what we call a prior appropriation, appropriation state. Um, and that's why you will see people arguing over, um, do you have the right to use that water? Um, and what is that right in the sense that I'm here, I'm ready to use it, so what if I came in 1980? Why do you get it because you came in 1900? Well, that's the law. They came in 1900 and they used it. Um, I'll get into some of the smaller aspects of that in a minute. Um, so on my outline, I do say who owns the water? Well, we all are, the public owns the water. Um, it goes back to England time, it goes back to the, the Code of Napoleon. Um, people can argue it's, it's, uh, um, it, it goes as far back as you can imagine, the idea that as a public resource, we all own it. So the right to the water is not necessarily the right to the molecules. The right to the water is the right to use the water. So it's called usufructuary right. And so you have the right to take the water and like I said, use it beneficially, efficiently, um, and continuously. And if you, if you mess up on any of those, on any of those uh, limitations, you lose, you'll lose the right um, because that's only a right to use. Now, the right to use itself, though, interestingly enough, is a property right. If you continue to use that water the way you're supposed to have used it, you have a property right in that water, and the government can't take it away from you without compensation. Um, and there, are, there have been cases on that. Um, but in any case, that, that's, so it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of interesting to say we all own the water, but we, we really don't all get a chance to take it whenever we want. Um, so you do own the water once it's in your glass. Once the water's in your glass, you own it. You can say you own it. Nobody can come and take it away from you if they have a senior water right. Um, <coughs> I want to go over a couple terms that I'll be, going, I'll be talking about today. One of them is an in court water right, and one is a perfected. An in court water right is one that you have the right to develop that, that water right. You've been given permission. Um, by the state, by the fact that the state has issued you a permit under the 1917 code, the state began this permit process where you will have to get a permit to get your water right. So they authorize you to use the, the water through this permit. They give you a development schedule, tell you you have to develop this in three years, five years. Some municipalities, it goes to 50 to 70 years. Even more than that, you have to develop it. That water that's in that permit is called inchoate because it's not yet being used. But those, but those entities, the municipality or the farmer or whoever else has the right to that water with, with basically if they, do continue, if they do develop it as they're supposed to with a priority date as of the date the, per, the application for that permit was filed. Um, so that's in co unused water that somebody has a right to use in the future. Uh, then there's the perfected. And a perfected water right is where you get the property right in the water. And that is where you have actually used the water. And your perfected right is to the water that's been actually beneficially used without waste, that quantity of water. Um, and I won't go into all the aspects of how the state um, um, papers that with certificates of permits, but basically that's the concept. Um, and I go, I go through that a little bit on the permitting. One of, the, uh, um, one of the things that I, I do want to make sure is, is that to, to, to recognize is that we, through several federal enactments, when the federal government finally realized they have to get into the water wars and started passing legislation 
um, Desert Land Act, the Organic Act, a couple other acts before the 19th, before 1900. Um, they, uh, uh, they, they basically said, one of the acts, that for the western states, we're severing the water from the land, from the public land, and that water is in the control of the states. The states get to decide how they want to allocate that water. Okay, so that's how the states actually, in a resource that is even like the Columbia River, the Snake River, um, in Washington and several of the smaller rivers coming in from, the, from Canada, that's how we, uh, um, oh, speak up. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's how we actually, as a state, get to control the water in the state. And the federal government really at that point stopped taking any action in the states. Now there are a few exceptions, and that's where you see, and this gets to who controls the water issue. Um, the exceptions are that the federal government itself has federal reserved water rights. Um, these, are, these are water rights that they reserved, not by words, as they call they implicitly reserved them, when they set aside land for specific purposes, let's say national parks. Um, they need water for that national park, for Mount Rainier National Park, they need water for something. Well, when they did reserve that land, they implicitly reserved the available water then in the system for the purposes of that national park. And that's gonna be governed, that's governed essentially by federal law then. And they get to use the water that they need. The priority date under the prior appropriation doctrine, since they will recognize that, is the date that they actually, Congress actually usually passed that act. There are exceptions here and there, but that's it. Part of the uh, reservation law, though, is also the uh, Indian reserved water rights. Um, of the recognized tribes in the state of Washington, they, uh, um, they received water rights um, at several different levels, but basically they uh, um, have water rights for what they call time immemorial. If um, they are a tribe that had fishing rights at usual and custom places, that they have a right to a quantity of water in order to take, that's necessary for them to take the fish at those usual and custom locations. Um, and so that's one of the issues I'm sure uh, up here in the Nooksack in this Waira is what is that? Um, do the tribes, I know there's two here, the two primary tribes, um, the Lummies and the Nooksacks, what is that interest that they have and what are those rights they have for in-stream flow for the purposes of um, protecting their time memorial water rights for taking fish? Um, I don't have any opinion on that. I don't want to provide an opinion on that, but that is, <laughs> that is the issue. <laughs> um, the, other <laughs> the other one, which is, which you was, is more of the basic reserved water rights for tribes is it came out of the Montana case. And that is where uh, um, a tribe in Montana all of a sudden saw, started seeing the river that went through its reservation drying up. And it was because of the farmers um, upriver who were legitimately, and I think in good faith, given patent to land and started irrigating and diverting off the river, started doing that. And less and less water was fl flowing through the reservation. And that reservation was set aside, the purposes of that reservation was set aside for agriculture purposes, for the tribe to have irrigation, uh, for the tribe to have um, grow crops, um, to uh, supposedly um, take the nomads and settle and we, we want you to grow crops. Um, no longer going across the country, you know, on and any, anything else, we want you to, um, that's the purpose of the reservation. Um, now, they then went to court and they, um, and this is one of the first cases that came out on reserved water rights for tribes, is that they have a right to take water from the river for the purposes of that reservation, i.e. irrigation, because you need it at Montana, for the irrigation of crops. The priority date, again, it goes right back to the prior appropriation doctrine, is generally the date of the, of the treaty. Um, when, the, when the tribe entered into the Treaty of the United States. And which brings up the issue is, you're talking about a treaty of government to government. And, uh, um, and so th the Supreme Court recognized that through that treaty, that tribe had the right to take water and their priority date predated then 
the farmers who were irrigating upriver, and they were given the right to take that water. A lot of nuances in that case, um, and there are many cases since then, but that is uh, when I talk about state law governing st allocation of water in the state, you just have to recognize that the federal government still has uh, control over uh, a large quantity of water um, in the sense of its reservations for national parks. Um, there can be an, a number of things that the federal government designates, um, and then, of course, for the tribes. Um, the other way that the federal government, um, and even the state, controls the water is through, its, uh, uh, is, is through the statu statutes that have been passed, um, by, by, like I said, by both the state and the federal government. One of the, uh, um, one of the uh, good examples of a federal statute that was passed, legislation, is the Endangered Species Act. And all of a sudden you have that overlay on, on, on uh, the use of water. And if you use water that causes what we might call a take under the Endangered Species Act, where you're taking a listed species, you are all of a sudden having to ask yourself, do I have to get, stop using that water because I am now violating the Endangered Species Act? That answer to the, that general question is a general, you have to stop or do something about it because you can't take endangered fish. Again, I'm being very general. That's a, that's a half a day seminar right there. So don't, <laughs> don't, don't, but it's, um, there have been several cases. One of, the, one of the first cases that came out was a irrigation case, a Glen Calusa Dam case, where they, they uh, Glen Calusa case, where the um, irrigation canal, the water, the diversion of water itself wasn't the problem. It was the screen that, the, that was uh, used by the, uh, by the irrigation company was, uh, was killing fish. And so they, they essentially said, you have to stop diverting because you're killing these endangered species. Um, so that, but that wasn't necessarily water. That was more of a, um, that was more of just the screen itself. There are a lot of, there are several other cases that have come down dealing just with water. Um, and there are, uh, um, uh, and there are also lawsuits being filed by these irrigation companies saying, okay, we'll give, we'll have to give the water up but that was a property right. You've damaged my property right, I want compensation. So you're getting that litigation too. So let me, um, I don't wanna, I, I'm probably coming down to, to a time limit here because it goes so fast, but let me, let me talk to you about some of the current issues. Um, or, well, the interested parties, this is something Don asked me to talk about. The interested parties are obviously anybody that has a right to beneficially use water. So I put that list on, on page two of my outline. It's, it's from your individual homeowner wanting to have a well, um, which is causing most of the problems right now, most of the issues right now is what we call the exempt wells, um, all the way up to um, municipalities, to very large um, agricultural enterprises. Um, you obviously have the tribes, and you also obviously have the interests of people in in-stream flow resources, which are like the aquatic and the fish issues, which the state has an interest in under, the, under their water quality laws as well. You have aesthetics. I just got finished hearing a case. I can't talk to you about it, but I'll just tell you that uh, um, the aesthetic is, it's an aesthetics issue of, of, uh, um, of putting a dam up on a small river in uh, north central Washington. And uh, um, the, peop the people are used to this water falling over the falls, and the dam is going to stop all water going over the falls. Uh, and uh, it, was, it became an issue of aesthetics. Who has a right to aesthetics? And under the Clean Water Act, actually, are they required to put some water over the falls so people who go there can see it an aesthetically pleasing fall? Um, so it's, it, believe me, we, we get into some great cases, very interesting cases. You also have the industrial users, and I, I've listed a few, which are like the paper mills, the refineries, the chip manufacturers. They use a lot of water. Um, somewhat in industrial use also is our dairies. I kind of plugged them in with agriculture, but dairies are our big industrial use. Um, current issues. Well, we're out of water, um, basically, in terms of the state permitting new water rights, unless you can get mitigation for that water. And that's one of the big issues here, is what are we using for mitigation? 
Is it in kind mitigation, molecule for molecule? And how do we do that? Do we condemn water rights? You have a private right of condemnation under the water code that you don't have to be a, a public entity to condemn a water right. You can be yourself and go and condemn a water right. Um, it hasn't happened much, but um, but uh, um, but cities and municipalities are condemning water rights right now. I was I've been involved in a few of those. Um, the uh, uh, the the uh, I list a few other ones. Um, And kind of part of the mitigation is, is what I say in here is, is that you look at seeking new supplies through conservation. You can do that. That's tough, but you can. Through transfers, water right transfers, you go buy a water right and transfer it over to use or buy the water right and put it what we call under the trust water rights program or just to retire the water right as mitigation for your new water right. And it doesn't make sense sometimes. Why not transfer it instead of just retiring it and get a new water right? Um, well, there's good examples as to why you want to do that, um, because it's not necessarily easy to transfer water rights. It's almost easier to buy them, put them in the trust water rights program, which I can talk about, or just retire them totally as mitigation for a new water right. There's, it's actually sometimes much easier than transfers. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about transfers if we have time. One of the things I talk about putting in water rights in the trust water rights program, which the state created many years ago, is, is that through the trust water rights program and also through an amendment to that statute is you can start creating water banks. And we've created, um, a client I had in, in my past firm, we created a very large water bank up in the Kittitas, which has got all kinds of problems right now in terms of issues with water availability for not only in-stream flow, but, but if you're hurting the in-stream flow, you're hurting the big irrigation districts down there. And uh, so everybody was kind of up in arms as to we have to control this. Um, but so how do we get water for the new development going up there? We go buy senior water rights, old water rights. We don't want the junior ones because they may get cut off because they get cut off when the seniors want the water rights. So we buy very senior water rights, 1890, 1895, and put them in a bank. And we bank them. And then we use that as currency. Those water rights then in the, in the, in the bank are a currency to, to uh, sell to people to, uh, um, for them to get their own water right. And many of these water rights are, and what's happened in some of the basin planning efforts right now, are just your single cabin owners or just your little subdivision. They can't get water right now, especially up in the upper Kittitas, unless they can find water to mitigate. So they go to these banks and they say, we will buy one of your half, what we call an acre foot of water maybe, um, of what's in your bank. And we will buy it and it has to meet some criteria um, before they can use it for theirs um, because it really has to mitigate for their water use. And so we give that to them and then they give it to the county and the county says, okay, you have your mitigation here's your building permit, you can go build on this thing. Or would they give it to ecology and say, okay, we have this, we'll give you a water right for it. Um, the fact is, is that you're in a market now that's totally different than anything that's been around. You're, where I was selling water rights in the past for $1,000 an acre foot, and you can, it depends on who you talk to, you can get from three homes to 10 homes built for an acre foot of water. You, I was selling those at years ago for thousand dollars an acre foot. On average, some of the water rights now are selling for seventy thousand dollars an acre foot, if not more than that now. Um, and it's not that people are buying an acre foot; they're buying a tenth of an acre foot. Okay, so they're maybe paying seven thousand dollars for a tenth of an acre foot so they can build their cabin. Because part of what's in my in my uh, um, outline is is that you are looking at now not just people having issues of getting water, but you are having now the tie-in with the local governments as well as the state government on growth issues. You are not gonna be able to get building permits. You're not gonna be able to get, and these are arguments, and I don't know where everything's gonna end up, but um, you're not gonna be able to get subdivision, subdivision final plat approvals by the local governments um, unless you have actual water rights uh, and where before it was different now that brings up and which is one of the primary issues and what's driving a lot of the uh, um, 
uh, it's driving a lot of the solutions that we're looking at today right now and the basin planning efforts is that under the law, as I said, the 1917 Act took what used to be people just go out there and take the water um, and uh, they ha now had to go to ecology for people that were getting new water, had, had to go to the state, and now it's the Department of Ecology, to get a water right permit. Um, so they would have to go, um, so, so now we have s them going in and getting a permit. But under the groundwater code, the law was passed, and the groundwater code actually was passed in 1944, 1945, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's under chapter 9044, so I always confuse those. Um, 1945, the groundwater code was passed, and it said you have to get permits just like for surface water in the 1917 code, but if you have a small de minimis use, um, you don't have to get a permit. You can just go do it. And they defined a small de minimis use as um, domestic use of 5,000 gallons a day or less, uh, irrigation of a lawn and garden of half an acre or less, industrial use of 5,000 gallons a day or less. Well, what, what's happening is, and what was happening is, people weren't getting water rights. They couldn't get them because even if you think water's in the ground, it is basically hydraulically connected. And I think most studies are showing that. They just finished one in the Yakima River that shows all that groundwater is somewhere, somehow, hydraulically connected to the surface water. So if there's no surface water available, you can't take out the groundwater because you're impacting the surface water. So all of a sudden, you start seeing groundwater, groundwater um, use um, and permits totally cutting off. Because, not because there wasn't groundwater, it's because the impact from taking that groundwater was on the surface water, where they were saying there's no water left available. Um, I'm down to my last minute. I see Chuck over there. So that is, that's one of the driving cor courses, is the, is the exempt wells, and that's where you get the, that's where you're getting a lot of these water basins, and a lot of it, uh, and uh, a lot of just individual cities, counties, trying to deal with how are we gonna deal with that? And it's in my outline, and I'm glad to take questions, and I think I have to go to questions. Thank you very much, and it, it is time for questions. Thank you. It's a complicated topic, and you've summarized it as quite well, but I know there's some questions out here. Is that one here? Okay. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. It was an excellent summary of the law gotcha. as it deals primarily with the allocation of a resource. What I would like to hear your comments on is some of the things that are making this resource increasingly scarce, uh, like fracking that is going on in many parts of the country, the extraction of the tar sands oil. Just two days ago, a front page story in the New York Times was talking about the High Plains Aquifer in Kansas and North Texas that is now dry, and whether they have prior appropriation or riparian rights doesn't matter if there isn't any water. Do you have any comments on what we might do to assure that there will be water in the future as against some of these uses that are going on? Thank you. Sure, I, I, I haven't dealt with the fracking issue at all other than I can say that obviously fracking is a new demand on water um, in terms of the water allocation. There's obviously the, also the issue of, and I just say it as an issue, I don't know what the answer is, um, of water quality issues. By, by forcing the water down there and fracking and, and are, we, are we now causing greater problems for the people that are using the water for especially domestic use because most of the water, most of domestic use comes from the groundwater. Uh, so I, uh, um, you know, I, th I think that those, th those um, industries in terms of water allocation just increase the demand and make it more scarce, make it more valuable. Um, now, in, in, the, um, in, in the Midwest, where the uh, um, aquifer, which stretches, I think, from Montana all the way down to Texas, has been mined for years, and they've all known it's being mined. This state has a law that essentially says uh, you c we can't be mining groundwater. Um, but for all practical purposes, that's what happens. Until such time that we're impairing somebody else's water right, we can take groundwater. And there's all kinds of fancy language in the code about that. Like um, safe sustaining yield is one. You have to make sure there's a safe sustaining yield in the aquifer. Nobody, it, it's hard to define that. 
I, I think if I ask somebody at the state, they probably say, "Well, we have it defined," but I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But that's that's part of that's part of the um, uh, how you apply your laws. Every state applies their laws differently. The Midwest is is definitely different than the West, um, and the East is obviously different. But I don't know if I answered your question. But I think that's that's basically is is that the laws have to be there and enforced. And and you know, it's kind of interesting as as my outline kind of kind of comes down to is is that we are having the fight between the people who have the water now and who want the water, not necessarily the state regulating to protect the water because it's all been allocated. So you're, in, you're, in, you're almost in like, a, like when I was talking about the water banks, you're into a situation where it's, we're in private enterprise. I just want to call your attention. You, uh, the, the newspapers and also you in your discussion talked about small rivers coming in from Canada. Here in Washington, uh, this is a great mistake because the Columbia River comes in to Washington and runs all through it, and 440 miles of the Columbia are in Canada, and indeed, the Canadian government is very involved because some years ago, the United States suggested that they build a couple of dams up there because prior to that, the water was so intense at, that you may remember, some of you, that it flooded uh, Portland to the point where rowboats were being used. And this was only like 30, 40 years ago. So I, w I would like to see the literature corrected on this matter. Yeah, that's the, um, the Columbia River is, also, is just incredibly fascinating. I, I recently read a book in terms of looking at the headwaters of the Columbia River and how it goes all around through Canada and eventually comes into the state of Washington. And I know that the treaty that they're trying to work on right now with Canada is um, very much involved, and, and that's, part, that's part of the discussion. I know that. Uh, thank you for your talk. So can individuals or organizations bank water rights, and how does that uh, work with the use it or lose it uh, law? Good, good point. You're getting into some of the specifics here. Um, one of the things that the legislature can do um, is change what otherwise was in the common law, which is use, use it or lose it. And when you put water rights into a bank through the trust water rights program, um, specifically in that law, they are not subject to the use it or lose it law. One of the things about the, there's, there's the law of abandonment, then there's the, um, then there's the statutory relinquishment law. And abandonment's still alive yeah, if you just uh, no. intend to not use it and you don't use it. And then there's, it's usually a fact-specific litigation that goes on there. And then there's a statute that said if you don't use your water for five consecutive years without sufficient cause, and they have specific things what sufficient cause are, you lose it. So under the trust water rights program where you have a water bank under that, or you just want to have a trust water right and put it in the river, you don't have to call it a water bank, you are specifically under that statute exempt from the relinquishment statute, which basically they're going to exempt you from, nobody's going to argue that you abandon the water right either, because you're already kind of using it within the river system. Uh, is there an established hierarchy of beneficial uses? Does the Okanagan PUD's desire to draw up, uh, dry up the waterfall that you're talking about, because it wishes to produce electricity, does that trump the, what, thousands of years of the Simulcomane Falls being a falls? This is where we get the crossover with water quality and water rights. Um, under the water rights law, I, I would say if there's a priority, it's for in-stream flow purposes. Um, because the, um, under the 1971 Water Resources Act, it says that you are to um, allocate water in a manner that protects minimum flows for whatever the, the, the attributes of, of, of the of the river system, fish, aesthetics, recreation. And only if there's an overriding consideration of public interest should you be able to impair that. 
Now, th how that how that's implemented is that the state the state sets these rules, which are the wire rules, and sets in-stream flows, and those become water rights. The in-stream flows to, and uh, with a priority date as of the date the rule is established, and so those those should be protected. But the state can come in and say, we will we think there's an overriding consideration of public interest to provide this water for something else, and it's a very high standard. And uh, um, but basically, if if you don't em employ the overriding consideration of public interest, the, ni the 1971 Water Resources Act, I think, would say that in-stream flows for the protection of those in-stream flow attributes is um, a priority, um, and, then, uh, um, and then everything else is equal, basically. Now, there's a lot of policy statements about making sure that we have public water systems and not small water systems and stuff like that. So you get tangled up in that a little bit. One of the things, though, when I say that in-stream flows are a priority, other than what the tribes may argue for their for their in-stream flow, any in-stream flow rights they may have, the in-stream flows that are that are set forth in the 1971 Water Resources Act, as well as there's another act out there that talks about it. Um, those priority dates are so junior, we call them, that they are that it's hard to protect them necessarily because there's so many senior water rights that can take that water. Remember what I said your right to take water is exclusive to anybody below you. So water rights up to 1970 that were issued basically are going to trump that in-stream flow water right or could trump it. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, it's a long-winded answer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, John Watts, uh, <clears throat> I have a question about the wire process. We've had in Whatcom County a, a wire process that went for four or five years before it kind of petered out. And uh, now <coughs> we'd like to see that restarted again. What uh, power does the state of Washington have to mandate that wire process proceeds? I. I don't know if the state, it depends on what we would define the wire process proceeding. Um, under the an initial act, which created the ability, uh, the implementation like, uh, statute for WIRAs was the 1971 Water Resources Act. And that's where you started seeing all the, the planning um, mechanisms through rule set forth and they and it basically started to become an in-stream flow management act and management programs then the planning units began and that was a law that was passed i'm trying to think of when 98 it was um <laughs> well, i can't remember the state that was where the planning units and you know to go and say okay we want you to do water allocation we want you to do water quality we want you to do in-stream flows and at some level those are voluntary and at, and at some level the state can't really force the hand to get that done. What they can do, if I remember correctly, and I apologize if I'm misstating this, is that if the planning unit and if the wire process doesn't get it done, ecology has the authority to come in and do it themselves, to set the in-stream flows and to set the plans and not do it in the cooperative manner that that planning unit was meant to do it. I'm not saying that, that they would not be cooperative, but I don't, I don't think, and I may be wrong on this, I don't think the state can force a wire process. They can sure as heck help it, assist it, and finance it, but I don't think they can enforce it. But if they want in-stream flow on a river, they can do it. I don't think that wire process, the planning unit process, trumped their authority to do that. It just said, don't do it until this, this um, group has a chance to do it on their own. And that's a real important thing that's happening right now is, is that the state is not only shifting its role because we're really fighting over water that's already been allocated, so it's kind of the private folks against private folks. Um, but also, there's a, 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 huge, a much even stronger push now for local governments, um, local entities, to control what's going on in their area. Um, and the Walla Walla is one that I, I worked with the Walla Walla group, that they actually are making decisions on water right transfers. They're getting consultation from ecology, but they are making the decision. They're not going through ecology. So they're doing water right transfers down there, putting water, right, water rights into trust, putting water rights into a bank, without, and, and they're doing it with an with a interesting group. It, and it's so, that's, so the wire process is, um, 
is evolving, continues to evolve. Uh, thank you of course, for your wonderful talk. Uh, my question is regarding navigation. Are there any navigation rights? How does that fit within uh, the use of the water and how much water is in the streams? And a tangential question back east. Still going? Oh, wrong. If, if a stream is navigable, you can go through it regardless of what the landowner says on either side, even if you're in a canoe and it's a small stream. Is that the case in Washington? So I really have that tangential thing. I'm sorry, taking advantage well, of you. Let, let, me, let me give you some issues and not necessarily answer the question. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, um, if it's a navigable stream, okay, under the federal definition of navigability, the state should own the beds of the stream. And the state owning the beds of the stream means that generally you should be able to go through and not have a fence crossing the river and stopping you from doing it. If it's a non-navigable stream, the property owners on either side of the stream own the bed to the center of the stream. And so there is, and I, you know, this is my problem. I helped write this book and I started reading it right before I got here and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> all these issues <laughs> I forgot about. That's one of them. Um, I, uh, um, the, 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 the last case that I remember reading, it may not be the last case I read, but I remember reading, <laughs> is that you can float down a non-navigable stream, but don't get out and touch the bed. You're trespassing then. Oh, you can't touch the bank either. You can never get on the bank. You can't even touch the bed. You are trespassing. But you're on, you're, you're on public water. You're on public water. Now, th it depends on each state. Like I said, in Colorado, <laughs> they'll put a barbed wire fence across the river, and <laughs> it's a barbed wire fence, and you just don't want to go through it. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask you, could you address Goody versus Meech? That's the 1906 Supreme Court law where the states um, issued in severality to uh, the lands to the tribes and how the federal, how that, are you familiar with Goody versus Meech? I would have to, I'd, I, I, I can't recall. I, 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 the name is very familiar. I just can't recall the facts and that thing. I just. Maybe you can give me more specific. Yes, Goody versus Meath is a U.S. Supreme Court case from 1906 that affirms lands of a reservation once assigned completely out have all their federal restrictions dropped and are completely under the exclusive jurisdiction of the state. And I think that's a really important issue that the state of Washington has been ignoring that case, and I just think that it's something that needs to have some clarity brought to it. Well, I probably through the process that's occurring right now, I would think that that would be clarity would be there. The, uh, um, the generally on the, on the reserved water rights area is when, uh, um, when land does leave um, a, a tribe or a tribal member, if it was patented to the tribal member, and goes to a non-tribal member, those water rights are generally going to be considered under state law then and subject to the beneficial use requirements or relinquished requirements. Um, each reservation is going to be different because it's it, it may have different terms of under the treaty. Y you just don't know. But ba but primarily is, is that you um, the Walton cases are really good examples if you've read those. The Anderson case um, out of the state, both out of the state, um, really talk about when does the state start controlling the water. Interesting thing is when I talked about who controlled water is, is that I um, took a case, Bureau of Reclamation versus State of Washington case, where the state went into the Columbia River, the Columbia Basin project, and the individual there applied for a applied for water allocation from the federal government, uh, from the Columbia Basin District, one of the irrigation districts within the Columbia Basin, which is a federal irrigation um, uh, irrigation district. Basically, there's three of them over there: the Columbia, the East, and the Quincy, and and they uh, um, and this gentleman w was said, no, we are not going to give you an allocation of water because your land is uh, such that it's not irrigable, and so you don't get any water. So this person came to the state and said, I want a state water right permit. I'm going to take it out of this water that is going right to the Columbia River anyway, and uh, it's water that was is draining off all the other land that the uh, um, that the federal project, it's the big Columbia Basin project, 
was, uh, um, and there's a lot of return flow from that project, it was returning into a ditch, and so the state gave them a permit. Federal government appealed and said, no, that's our water. And, uh, um, and our state Supreme Court agreed with the federal government, said that's their water. And uh, they and state you have no right to go into the Columbia Basin District and give this individual a water right. And there are several reasons. One of them is economics, because the federal government said we <laughs> that's our livelihood. If we s all of a sudden see the state coming in and giving water rights to people within the reclamation district, that's a real problem for us. The other thing is, is that who owns the water in a reclamation district? So it, it, it doesn't go to your question, but it goes into the issues of who controls the water. Tom, I think we just have time for one more. It's okay. over here. Uh, you spoke about how um, the expansion of the American West really brought about a different sort of philosophy of water, uh, thinking about water rights. And uh, as we know, in the West, much of the development over the last century has occurred when water was thought to be plentiful and cheap and always available. Um, now, that's not the case. Uh, you know, Las Vegas and Los Angeles come to mind. So my question is, has state and federal legislation kept pace with the actual situation uh, of water supply and demand? Or, or is there a need for a fundamental overhaul of the legislation that governs uh, water rights? <laughs> you can hurry up if that I was answer, God. Very um, simple. I, uh, I think uh, one, of, one of the things that, I, I don't know if the federal government has kept pace. Um, there are a lot of issues with uh, federal statutes um, that uh, uh, that really put a lot of uncertainty into the allocation of water. Um, the states, you know, I, I think like the state of Washington has really tried. Um, many times, it's it's really it's easier to pass a bill and not and just pass it and overlay it on a, on, on the rest of the legislation and not pull out anything, it, it's really hard to, to say we're going to redo the water law. It's a lot easier to say we're going to have this, this law and it's just going to overlay on this other law and it actually starts causing confusion. Um, so I, it's hard for me to say that, that the states haven't kept up. It may be that the states haven't, and I'm kind of going on a limb here, haven't necessarily implemented the laws that they have in a manner that, that keeps up. And they're behind all the time, and, and sometimes that's and sometimes that's that's the reflection of of the fact that w water rights, the people that control the water rights, if they're perfected or if they're if they're using if they're developing them like they're supposed to, they essentially have a property interest. It's really hard to revamp the water law when the courts have essentially said that water right that you have is a property right. Because if you revamp it to say, we're going to start setting forth, these are the primary purposes we want. We're going to start with domestic, or we're going to start with egg, or we're going to start with hydro. It doesn't matter. That's the primary one. You can't tell the people down here who have an 1890 priority date water right, sorry, we're revamping all of this. So it's, it's, we've, we've kind of created a situation where it's, not, it's even more than revamping. So I don't know if I answered that. But. You did. Thank you. <laughs> Tom, before you leave, we want to present you oh. with a gift. We do this every time we have a wonderful speaker and you qualify. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Enjoy walking places too. And let's thank Tom for coming. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much.